Yeah. Tiffany comes and has any problems. Okay, are we recording? We're recording. Okay, good morning, you guys. It's uh, a lovely day here in the Mojave, and we are going to do chapter 8.4 to 8.9 from your Sustaining the Earth books. This is something that's covered the environmental science. We're looking at the global perspective. Okay, we're going to look at flooding, pollution, treating water pollution, and look at the global perspective. The rest of the class is going to focus back in on California and a little bit more on the United States and then specifically the Mojave. We're going to get to go out and actually see, we've got several field trips in this and we've also got a couple of workshops. So you guys are going to get an, an, a direct exposure to how our water is managed in the Mojave. So. All right, so that's just showing you where this comes from, chapter 8. We're actually, excuse, that should be water pollution 8.5 to 8.9. And um, so how can we reduce the threat of flooding? We talked about how California, even this area, very low rainfall, but it comes in sudden events. And we're all familiar with that. Last week when we did this, I was telling you the story about a couple years ago, the fellow that got so much rain up on the corner here of Peach that he got washed under the road and popped up in the lake at, uh, at VVC, which is a pretty incredible story. Um, how do we prevent it? Well, it's all about floodplains. Um, floodplains are the plot, obviously, where a river floods out naturally. We've changed those a lot. We've put up big levees. We've channelized rivers. The LA River is just, just a concrete banks most of the way down now in LA. And in those flood plains, there also we want to know that, need to know, they're highly productive wetlands. As we know, that's where all the young animals, bugs, uh, fish, shellfish, that's with the nursery for them. Okay? They also provide natural flood and erosion control. Okay? Um, in, in New Orleans, with those big floods, we know that one of the reasons for that flood was their wetlands had been pretty much decreased and weren't in very good shape. They basically act as a big sponge. They main, maintain high water quality. We'll be talking later about how we can actually construct a wetland. Man can construct a wetland to treat water. W treating water is all an ecological process. Nature takes care of our water treatment mostly. And it can recharge groundwater. Okay? And um, so human activities are mostly responsible these days for this flooding. We just saw in L.A. the last few months, a few weeks ago, really, a month or so ago, terrible flooding after that one storm. And that was because we had those huge fires in the foothills up there. Okay? Um, and so we've also gone and replaced the natural vegetation with farm fields all across California. We drained wetlands to make very productive, wetlands and floodplains to make very productive uh, farming land, right? That's where the good soil is. That's where there's good flat land. And we've put pavement on, and buildings on them, okay? All right, so if we're looking at a nice forested, healthy uh, hillside here, it's very much part of the hydrological cycle, which we'll go over again uh, tomorrow a little bit. But the trees and the roots are stabilizing the soil. They're providing a place where water can get held and go into the groundwater and or flow into this, uh, the, sub, the surface water down here, showing a little stream, right? And everything's functioning really well um, until we come along and say, hey, okay, we'd rather on these mountain slopes here, we, we need that forest, we're going to clear cut that forest, right? We know that's an unsustainable for practice to cut all the trees, or we're going to do some grazing, okay, and, and for cattle. And that changes the whole system. Then we've, we're getting erosion. Erosion is a form of water pollution, but it's also a form of destroying the, the, the ecosystem and taking off that topsoil. So even if we replant uh, the trees that are hard to establish. Okay. Can we reduce floods? Well, we can rely on nature systems. We just talked about that. We can rely more on wetlands. We can restore wetlands. I don't know if you guys know this, but today in modern America, if you really want to get yourself in trouble with the Environmental Protection Agency and a lot of other agencies, go and, and, and change a wetland. 
We had a situation here at VVC a few years ago where one of our administrators thought it would be cool to clear out the little wetland down in front of the fish hatchery that's on VVC land. And we really had to put some pressure to bear or, or, some, or some pull back some favors not for, for VVC not to get a big fine, even though that's a constructed wetland. We built that wetland. Okay, so we can also rely on uh, less on engineering devices, dams, levees, channelized streams like the LA stream is a channelized, LA, LA River is channelized. We talked about the dam, um, the app at, uh, oh, geez, today it's gone right on my hand, the big dam up north, I'll think about it, where it was last year, it was about to break, and we, they were literally dropping big boulders in on, on the spillway um, to prevent it from actually breaking. I forget. Matt, do you remember, Mr. Huffman, do you remember the name of that, that dam again? I believe it was Folsom Dam. Yeah, uh, yeah, Folsom was one of them, but I was thinking of another one too. So anyway, uh, cool. Or Moving on. Oroville. Oroville, thank you. Oroville Dam. Yes, it's very critical for our water supply down here because that's where a lot of the water is stored. And we'll learn about the state water project that pulls the water all the way north of Sacramento and brings it down here. Okay, so water pollution. Contamination from chemicals, it can be excessive heat from a power plant, um, it can be bacteria, it can be all sorts, it could be human waste. Um, and we just want to talk about a point source and non-point source. Point source points to a specific spot that it comes in. We have, for example, a uh, chemical factory, and that chemical factory is a point source. It might release chemicals directly into a water source, right? Non-point source is more where it's distributed. We've got a bunch of farmers farming along the Colorado River, for example, which we have. They're all fertilizing, they're putting down pesticides, and if we don't do that well and wisely, those pesticides and those extra fertilizers can, can wash off and that's a non-point source because you can't point to any particular farmer necessarily. It's a whole big region. Okay, uh, water pollution. We can got that. Uh, this is just another one about those. So the same slide, different look at it. Uh, just showing you point sources would be sewage discharge, like at Victor Valley Wastewater Authority, if they were still discharging uh, semi-treated. Uh, water over there in, in Atalanta or a Grand, then that would be a point source. Non-point source is croplands, uh, logged or burnt forests, city lawns, golf courses, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, major water pollution pollutants have harmful effects. What are the largest polluters? Well, agriculture. So it could be sediment if we don't manage the soil properly and it erodes, that's a pollutant. What's causing a lot of the breakdown and dis destruction of our coral reefs? Well, that's actually sediment. Sediment, little fine sand and clay particles, silt is literally drowning out those, uh, those uh, <coughs> coral reefs. Okay? Livestock waste, we're going to look at how they do, how they manage that at the dairy we visit on May 1st. Uh, indus industrial facilities, they can be, it could be organic, inorganic, or organic. Inorganic means it was never living. Organic could mean that it comes from some kind of living source, right? Mining could be sediment and toxic chemicals. Um, we've had several cases of that locally. Um, in, all right, so here's a little, little uh, graphic here of organisms. Um, most of the, the diseases in the world are waterborne. They're carried in water. They live in water. So taking care of water pollution is really critical to our health. Okay? And there's a list of some of the really lovely diseases you can get. Right? You've all heard about these. Uh, we might not have had it unless you've been to Mexico recently. I got this a couple years ago in Mexico, and it was two weeks, and it, I got seriously sick, enteritis. 
And so we've got typhoid fever, cholera, giardia. We know about giardia if you drink water um, from, from streams that have been polluted even by livestock or, or wild animals. Uh, amoebic dysentery, all sorts of bacteria, viruses, and little protozoa, and even worms that can cause serious health effects, okay? So that's why we treat our sewage. That's why we even <laughs> these days keep cattle out of river as much as possible and only let them drink in certain places and keep their food away from the river. If they've been giving a supplement, we put the, the, the food away so the cattle go and defecate away from the river, okay? How do we do this? We, we all, uh, all our water is tested and we can do a fecal coliform bacteria test means these coliforms, main class of bacteria, coliforms like E. coli, are found in our, in our feces, including our feces. That's why we tell people they really need to wash their hands when they're working with food. Okay, major water pollutions and their effects. Um, so one of the biggest things that happens with water quality is if we pollute with too much of this of sewage, for example, it it causes a, a dissolved oxygen deficit. Okay, um, and let me see if this is up here. So let's just look at this. If we if we look at this slide here, we've got some pollutants coming in here on a pipe sewage. Let's say fish and everything up there have got are living pretty normal. They've got enough oxygen below that. Oxygen starts getting taken up by fungi and bacteria and all of that kind of stuff. And it actually pulls the extra oxygen out of the water. And we can actually have a fish die off. Okay? So we can actually have an area back down in here where the fish and some of the more beneficial organisms will actually die because we put this food source. This is a good food source for all living things, okay? Yes, it's treating it, but we have to make sure we don't dump it directly into a water source and we treat it first in a controlled system where we manage how much oxygen is applied. When we go to the Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant, you'll see they spend a lot of money and energy putting oxygen, putting air into the water to keep it oxygenated so all those bugs can live, okay? Pollution of freshwater streams, uh, most developed countries have sharply reduced this, but this is a huge problem in the rest of the world, right? In South Africa, where I'm from, yes, we might have decent uh, water systems to the cities, but what's happened in recent years and is happening in a place called Cape Town right now is about half again people have moved, and they move into little shanty towns which are all around, and those have no facilities at all, no toilets, no sewerage systems, and so where does all that sewage go but directly into the water source? Where do they have to go get their water? Well, from the local river or from the lake because they don't have tapped water to their houses. Okay? This is Ganges River where, you know, there's this tradition of cleansing themselves in the Ganges. But the problem is the Ganges is very highly polluted. So they can have, a few years ago, they... Um, had a serious health issue around their, one of their major uh, religious activities that happens in the Ganges, where they, were, where they were baptizing people and that sort of thing. Okay, um, low flow makes lakes and reservoirs vulnerable to water pollution. Um, so if we, if streams aren't moving very fast, they won't be able to kind of move those pollutants out of the way. And then we talk about, talked about eutrophication. Okay? Eutrophication is the, is the biological, ecological term for when we get a bunch of nutrients from sewerage in, 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 a, in a water body and all the bacteria and stuff respond, fungus responds, um, and algae responds, and that's called eutrophication. Cultural eutrophication is when man, man caused that. Okay, so that's a term you need to know. The natural enrichment of a shallow lake, estuary, or slow flowing stream would be eutrophication. Cultural eutrophication is the unnatural. In other words, we've, we've got septic 
sewerage going straight into that stream, for example. Okay. Uh, pollution of the Great Lakes, that's a local case study. Um, a lot of people depend on the Great Lakes a few years ago. Last year, up to last year, we had that big lead uh, contamination is issue in Flint, Michigan. And so um, those large bodies of water, like the Great Lakes, are great resources, but we also have to manage the water quality in them. Okay? So there's eutrophication, cultural eutrophication again. Um, I kind of mixed two things together here, so you're getting a couple of repeated slides. What are the major pollution problems affecting groundwater, right? So we're going to learn and know already that we get all our water from groundwater here locally. And so um, we need to make sure that we don't allow anything to get in our groundwater. We're going to visit PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, out in Hinkley, where I think some of you guys, you guys have already been there, where they allowed chromium-6 to get into the water supply. Um, and that was a carcinogen and a major health issue. Okay? So what are the kinds of things? Fertilizers and pesticides, we talked about already. They can get into surface water, they can get into groundwater, gasoline, and organic solvents. Okay? So um, chromium-6 would fit into the category of a solvent. Right? They used it to dissolve rust on those pumps. They used to compress the, the gas that's coming, the natural gas that's coming from Oklahoma and Texas. Okay, so here's a really nice little slide just looking at when we've got man involved, us involved, people involved, all the different pressures it puts on to our groundwater systems, right? And we'll get to what a confined aquifer is, unconfined and a confined aquifer, right, later. But so, um, you know, we can have all sorts of things polluting our groundwater system, okay? including this one up here. We don't have much of this, but de-icing road salt for de-icing roads. All right, pollution of groundwater. Um, according to the EPA, one or more organic chemicals contaminate about 45% of municipal groundwater supplies, right? In LA, there's areas, many areas of LA where they just can't use the groundwater because it's too contaminated. And we're very fortunate up here that we have some of the best quality groundwater anyway, but that doesn't mean that we need to take our guard off, right? We need to continue that. Uh, so case study, arsenic in groundwater is a natural threat. Arsenic, as you know, is a, is a, is a poison, a very serious poison. It actually, like lots of other things actually, chromium-6 can do this as well, can leach out of the rock. So you've got the groundwater sitting down there in those lower sediments, it can leach out things like arsenic, okay? And that's a local problem. We have, I mentioned the other day, we have some wells over deep wells. Normally this is older water, deeper well, over in the Baldy Mesa area where the arsenic levels are too high, okay? So really key term I want you guys to know and write down and understand there's a minimum contaminant level. You'll hear this over and over, right? MCL, minimum contaminant level. The Environmental Protection Agency sets these. And so a few years ago, it was set at 50 parts per billion for, for arsenic. And through research on health issues, they decided to drop it to 10. So about five years ago now, they did this. So they, you, the water company could could get away with having 50 parts per billion, they dropped it to 10. So that put the city of Victorville in a, in, a, in a tough spot. They have one arsenic treatment facility over there, it's very expensive, but then they also take water from different wells and they mix them so that we won't have um, contamination issues um, or that, that MCL won't be too high. They got to keep it below 10. Okay, so don't forget that term MCL. Okay, uh, prevention, effect weight, protect groundwater, pollution. Okay, so all the slides really saying is we need to prevent the pollution up front. Once it gets in the groundwater, it's extremely ex expensive. When we go to Hinkley, you guys have been to Hinkley, that's a massive, very, very expensive project to do all those things to try to get the chromium-6 out of the water. 
if they stop it at the front end, that's a way, way cheaper and more effective, right? And groundwater is also harder to, for nature to teach, treat because it's very cold down there. There's no oxygen down there for extra bacteria go, you, to grow. If you know what they do in, uh, in Hinkley, they actually inject ethanol down there for some bacteria to grow that will actually convert the chromium-6 to chromium-3, right? Um, so it's better to clean up, uh, rather uh, prevent the pollution rather than clean up. Much better, okay? Um, drinking water, it's held in reservoirs, and then most cities, we don't have to do much of this. Some local companies maybe have to add a little bit of chlorine um, just to make, to get rid of some of those coliform bac bacteria, but um, that's how it's treated, the, the, the companies treat it. Other parts of the world, easiest way to do it is just to put it in a clear plastic bottle, something clear where UV light can, can kill those bacteria. Okay, that's just a natural way to do it. At Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Authority, they do that. Their final stage to kill extra bacteria is with UV light, right? And I think we visited that with you guys too. Okay, bottled water, good option, very expensive. The, up until very recently, the controls on bottled water weren't as good as on tap water. So you actually could get sick easier with bottled water. Lots of myths. Um, about it, you know, we talked about, you know, arrowhead water, you see the pictures of it bubbling down a mountain stream. Well, actually, it just comes from a groundwater well, two groundwater wells, apparently right there in San Bernardino at the bottling plant. So they're pulling the same kind of water that we're getting up here. It's not, it's not, uh, not that bubbling mountain water that they advertise, okay? Uh, what are the major water pollution problems affecting oceans? Huge problem. Most of it's coming from land. We've got the huge problems with plastics. Um, and we've all got all sorts of sewage that's been dumped into the ocean. Even to the extent we talked about how in the United States, down close to the ocean in this area, they treat it to the secondary level. We'll find out what that is real soon. We'll have a guest lecture on, on uh, wastewater treatment, and then they pump it five miles out in the ocean. Uh, that's happening right here in the LA Basin, to a fairly large extent, for, apparently. Um, I heard something where maybe 50% of LA sewage is treated that way. So it's really not treated to drinking water standards the way we do it up here, okay? The way you could literally drink it when it comes out of the Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Authority. Okay, um, so this is just a look at all the different kinds of uh, pollution that can happen to the ocean. Um, and harmful algal blooms, the red tides, you guys have heard of the red tides. Well, that's just caused by warm water, too much nutrients, and a red algae takes over that can actually be quite toxic. So at times you're asked to stay out of the water with a, a red tide, even here in Southern California, or and you're definitely told not to eat the shellfish. Okay, Oxygen depletion in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So here's a depleted oxygen zone, this green up here. That's because we've got too many nutrients coming down the Mississippi River, right? Could be extra fertilizer, could be some, uh, some sewerage. And it's depleting the oxygen out here for the ocean animals because we've got algae and all that kind of stuff that's blooming and causing that dissolved oxygen sag, right? How do these animals, these animals fish, get, get the oxygen? Well, it's dissolved oxygen in the water. And so if we put too many nutrients in, we can cause that oxygen sag, okay? Largest estuary in use is Chesapeake Bay. One of my favorite places to go. We have a friend who lives there, um, and it's, it's struggling. Okay? Ocean pollution from oil, we all know about the BP deep well disaster. Uh, interesting movie to watch. I watched that movie last year. But we're out there with these extremely deep wells pulling uh, oil out of the ocean. We're also fracking out in the ocean to the extent even here in Southern California of Santa Barbara, 
had a nice little oil spill there a couple of years ago. Um, and again, prevention is the ticket. Just had an ocean, ocean tanker, oil tanker go down in the, I think it is in the West Indies. Does anybody remember that? Um, coastal water pollution, again, left side prevention, right side cleanup. Uh, we want to stay with prevention if we can, at all possible. How can we best deal with water pollution? So we can reducing surface water pollution from non-point sources. We've gone through all of these. Um, Clean Water Act. So we have very, very, very stringent water regulations locally. And we'll get somebody to come and talk to one of the classes. It's governed by the Water Board, the California Water Board. Our local agency, the region, is called the Houghton. It's a region of California in the desert here. It goes all the way up to Lake Tahoe. And they have a big office in Victorville. They employ maybe 20, 25 people. And they're in charge of water pollution in this area. Okay. Sewerage treatment reduces water pollution. Septic tanks are great. But septic tanks are inadequate. We won't be able to go into great detail. But they're anaerobic. They can only treat to a certain level. And septic, the septic from septic tanks is quite toxic, actually. So when, even when they take it at Victor Valley Wastewater Re Treatment Plant, when a septic tank's being, being pumped, they, um, they have to let it into the system slowly because it can actually kill, upset the ecology over there. That's the one big ecological system. Too much septic tank sewerage upsets that, OK? So we're going to go through this later, but wastewater or sewage treatment plants are three phases. We're going to go through that real quick. Primary sewage treatment, which is a physical process. All the stuff you throw down the, the toilet that um, doesn't need to be there basically gets scraped off the top. And if you've been there, that's kind of the gross part. But guess what? We did that. We need to kind of see that, give people awareness that they can't just throw things down the toilet to get rid of them and then forget about them. Okay? Secondary sewage treatment is the biological process with bacteria. Remember, they put, that, they, 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 they put that sludge stuff, brown stuff, water out in the tanks, put a lot of oxygen through it, encourage these anaerobic bacteria and protozoa to grow. They uh, eat it all up, decompose it. And then finally, tertiary or advanced sewage treatment is special filtering processes. They might take it through special processes, and then finally they bleach with chlorine or disinfect it with ultraviolet light. So the ectobacteria don't go back out into our water supply. And then literally where we are, they just let it run straight out into the Mojave River to go on down to Barstow. Fortunately, Barstow doesn't realize this, but they get most of their water from our sewage treatment plant, right? It goes down the river, goes into the groundwater, and goes down to Barstow. Okay, so hang on. Let's see where we are. Can we improve uh, conventional sewage treatment? Um, we can do a lot. Um, we can also, one of the biggest ways is we can go to wetland based systems. This is when we man ma make wetlands. We build wetlands. Uh, these are called constructed wetlands. Several dairies up here now are thinking about doing these. Okay. Um, reducing water pollution through sewage treatment. Uh, this is just looking at what a septic tank, how it works. Uh, there's constructed wetlands again. Composting toilets. Anyone, you guys got a composting toilet? Show of hands if you got a composting toilet. Mr. Hafan, do you have a composting toilet? No. No. Does uh, no. Mr. Slade have a composting toilet? Yeah, baby. Probably. <laughs> Very proud of that. It was a birthday present. How weird is that, huh? I got a composting toilet for my birthday. Now that's strange behavior. Come on. Okay. Um, so we can use solar energy to run these things. Um, out there at Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant, they're actually using the gas that comes off the treatment to run their pumps to put the oxygen in. So they're almost going to be carbon neutral. I think in a couple of years, 
they're, they're basically going to produce the old, own, all the own energy at Victor Vest Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant. This is a, a uh, these are constructed wetlands or a thing called a living machine. Um, and folks are starting to do this in the, um, even some homes have got this incorporated into their homes. And of course, just back to that really, that's a form of aquaponics. You can actually grow food, right? Crayfish, fish, and that can actually be eaten um, if you do this right. Not easy to do, but um, takes a lot of management, okay? So primary sewage treatment physical, secondary sewage treatment biological, we already went over that. This is a really important uh, slide that we'll cover in much more detail when we get to the treatment, but this is looking at the actual parts of the system at a place like Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant. Tertiary treatment, final cleaning process, water is chlorinated, or we use ultraviolet. Okay. Sewerage sludge, biosolids. So after we've, after we've used the bacteria to eat all this stuff up, there's still solids left, including the dead bacteria. What do we do with that? Well, it's used as compost, right? So right next door to Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant, and I hope this time we'll be able to visit them, there's a composting facility that takes green waste, household waste, green waste from LA, and makes compost. Well, they'll take a certain amount of that sludge uh, from or what's called biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant and incorporate it into compost that can be used in agricultural land. So which obviously, again, what do we... Two things there, we're getting rid of a waste, we're also substituting for chemical fertilizers. You guys remember that in agriculture we're trying to get away from the synthetic chemical fertilizers. Okay, so there's some stuff going on there in, in terms of sludge. We'll see out at the dairy, they actually pump the dairy waste out onto, out onto the alfalfa. Developed countries, um, so basically, we, we use more of a political process. Um, drinking water quality, centralized water treatment plants, and watershed protection. We're going to look at a really interesting one up at the top of our, up at uh, Lake Silverwood, where Crestline actually dumps, I think we can use that word, their wastewater into the top of the Mojave River watershed, and how we need to make sure that that gets treated properly. And, and there's a farmer up there that is grazing cattle up there, raising grass, and basically that grass is bioremediating. That's a good word for you guys to remember. Remediation is treatment, bioremediation is using biological processes, right? Um, there's your MCL, maximum, oh, sorry, did I say minimum? I should have said maximum contaminant level. So for, for, for arsenic, it's 10. Every one of the major pollutants have a maximum contaminant level. Can't let it go above 10 parts per billion, otherwise the water district will fight, face huge fine. What happened in Michigan? The people there ignored and hid the fact that the lead levels were above the minimum contaminant level. Okay? Using laws to protect drinking water, um, you know, back in the 70s, we saw the Safe Drinking Water Act. We were in the habit of just dumping our sewage in the river, in the water sources. A lady by the name of Rachel Carson came along and several others brought attention to that. And we started putting, we developed the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and we started putting in layer upon layer of different laws for safe drinking water. Okay. Is bottled water the answer? Well, we've gone over that a little. Water pollution, solutions, prevent groundwater contamination, reduce non-point runoff, reuse treated wastewater for irrigation. So one thing you'll notice locally that's kind of cool is we now have two water treatment plants, one in Apple Valley over near Oto Park and one in Hesperia, and they're pre-treating the water that's to that secondary level before it goes on to Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant and putting it back out on golf courses and on lawns. So we're recycling it, okay? 
Uh, many people in Apple Valley have, um, have gray water. That water is called gray water, the water that's not directly polluted from your toilet. It's called gray water. I have a gray water system. I've got my septic system, the toilets, separated from the showers and the sink and all of that, and that goes out on the plants. We're, re we're reducing. Work with nature to treat sewage. Practice the four R's of resource use. Refuse. Don't buy things we don't need. Don't use things we don't eat. Maybe don't eat that fourth steak of the day. Reduce, recycle, reuse. And then, of course, reduce air pollution infant, and then some of the cultural social issues we know from sustainability that affect all of this is reduce poverty. People in poverty can't take care of this stuff themselves. And then ultimately, try to reduce birth rates because our big environmental issues just plain too many people. Okay? What can we do? I think you guys can go through that on your own. Compost your food waste. I was very interested a few years ago in Australia, lots of school children are taught to have a little vermiculture bin, a little worm bin at their back door. And they take their food waste and put it in there and let the worms um, take care of it. All right, and that's it. Um, do you guys have any questions? Any comments? Got one yawn. Was that bad, huh? All right, so we will see you guys tomorrow at a little after 10, a little after 9, Mr. Huffine? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Hey, Thank and you. let's get come up with a plan to pay your fees. There's no reason that you've got this.